Hello interwebs! Uh, so for those of you who may or may not have known, I recently did a panel at LA Comic Con that was sponsored by Pride.com, which is a company I used to work for full time and still do occasional work for, uh, called Queering Sci-Fi, How LGBTQ People Find Themselves in Straight Media. Uh, and I did this along with some really wonderful guests who I won't introduce here because you can see them in the video in front of you and uh, they'll actually introduce themselves when we get to the actual recording of the panel. Uh, we talked a ton about queer coding of characters, finding representation outside of explicitly uh, queer or LGBTQ characters, as well as uh, issues of representation of people of color and queer people of color, uh, as well as some, some of the problems and benefits of finding non-explicit queer representation or with uh, erasing queer representation in film and television. And we talked about everything from X-Men to IT Chapter 2 to video games to, of course, Star Trek, because you know if it's me, you're going to have Star Trek in there. Uh, so this is a recording of the entire panel, and I hope you guys all enjoy it. Um, just to forewarn you, the video does cut out at about 30 minutes in, but the audio stays great the entire way through, so please stick around after the video cuts out. Uh, but regardless, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoy our discussion, and until next time, as always, live long and prosper. Okay, let's get started. We're missing uh, one of the panelists, but she'll be here, here shortly. Um, good afternoon, girls and gays. Hey. Um, my name is Rafi Ermak, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Pride.com. This is I'm Jesse. <laughs> I contribute to Pride.com, so he's my boss. <laughs> so treat him nicely. And she's the host of our uh, web series called Nerd Out, where she uh, does a bunch of uh, explainers on like uh, cool, queer, nerdy uh, topics. Yeah. And talk about Star Trek a bunch, because, mm -hmm. of course. <laughs> of course. Hi, I'm Ooh, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Satine. I'm co-host of Bit Different Podcast with this one, which is like a queer, inspired, nerdy pop culture video game podcast. And I'm Rob, co-host of Bit Different Podcast, and also um, I make game trailers for a living. So, at least I, I work in the nerd space uh, by day. Any, anyway. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> and their <coughs> podcast is wonderful, and I love it. Ah, so, oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the, um, the reason that Jesse and I started this, uh, wanted to do this panel is just to talk about um, queer representation and um, some of our favorite titles and topics, especially in sci-fi, and talk about the future of queer representation, the past, and like how it's um, changed over the years. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, before we get started, and we have like a bunch of questions uh, that we're like going to talk about in topics on the panel. I just wanted to give for those of you, I'm sure a lot of us already know this, but a good primer on queer representation in Hollywood and sort of the big budget representation. Um, so as many of you may or may not know, way, way, way back when Hollywood started, queer representation was not uncommon. That may be surprising, but even the best picture, one of the best picture winners, uh, Wings, in like 19. 20 something, I forget the exact year. 28, uh, thank you very much. Featured a um, same gendered kiss in it. And there was a lot of films that had a lot of like same gender relationships or even sort of lesbian relationships. Mor Morocco featured um, the first lesbian kiss in all of cinema. That was way back in the 20s. So then when you hit around the 50s, you get something called the Hayes Code or the Hollywood Production Code of 1950 or 30. My blanking on the years. Anyways, the Hayes Code comes around because of, you know, everyone's sort of saying, like, Hollywood's morally degenerate and corrupt, which is probably true, but not for showing queer people. Um, <laughs> and so uh, they uh, instituted the Hayes Code, which was uh, done by this, you know, Christian leader, um, William Hayes, I believe is his name. And he basically uh, created a code that was super, you know, racist, sexist. Um, saying you couldn't like show law enforcement in a bad light, you couldn't show interracial um, relationships or sex, and obviously you know queer sex or queer relationships in any way, shape, or form. So what that led to was characters that became what was known as queer coded, and a lot of us know today if you know what queer coding is, we see it as sort of a bad thing. Um, but at the time, what it was was a way to show queer characters um, without actually saying they're explicitly queer. It'd be like, oh, this character would be a bit more, you know, a guy character would be a bit more effeminate, or a woman would be a bit more uh, masculine presenting, which is a stereotypical way to present queer people, but was a way to at least signal to the audience, hey, look, here's a queer character, even though we can't say it's queer. Um, and unfortunately, as things progressed, I mean, it was bad enough that they had to do it that way, but it was at least a way to have some form of representation. But as things progressed, because whenever you had those characters, they tend to have to be punished 
for the transgressions that was in the Hayes Code. You know, if you had like a, a criminal, the criminal had to be killed at the end. That's why we got a lot of gangster films where criminals died. Um, so queer people tend to be more and more, more coded as villains. And as, even as the Hayes Code went away, that caused, um, that, that sort of stuck around in cinema. That's why you see in like Disney movies, a lot of the villains like Scar, Jafar, um, pretty much name any Disney villain even up until today, you have villains that are sort of queer coded, like they you know, talk more feminately, they don't have any partners. Um, if they, Ursula's like a drag queen, sort of using queerdom as a villainous thing. Um, and that leads us to today where we still get a lot of queer coded characters. We're starting to see more um, explicit representation usually in smaller screen adaptations because smaller screen adaptations you can, you know, there's less at stake. Um, Hollywood's like, oh, if we have a queer character, we can't sell it to China as like South Park brought to light recently, but that's sort of been around for a while um, because China, you know, censors anything queer related. Um, so, so um, and so when we get to bigger budget um, productions, you're starting to see a push for it, but it's more in the sense of like, oh, well, it's starting to become safer um, and more, you know, able to, you know, do it without risking money because capitalism is awful and we all know this. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so that's sort of a brief history of queer coding just to sort of get us started. And mm -hmm. I think what we wanted to talk about today was, you know, how we found those representations. What, what spoke to queer people and us as queer people um, as we watched science fiction and what we found, so, yeah. I feel like I'm in school or something. Yes. <laughs> um, so I guess to kick things off, my first question for all of you all is, um, what do you think it is about science fiction, science fiction and um, like other geeky genres too, like fantasy and superhero, that is so inherently queer and that immediately draws um, big audiences of LGBTQ people? Um, well, at least I feel like a lot of the, the sort of motivation that would drive a lot of um, queer people to sci-fi is this idea of <clears throat> hopefully a more perfect world like some sort of other take on things where hope like there's another sort of like i don't say rule set but there's another sort of set of morals where maybe we haven't had to go through this sort of like bleaching of our presence up until more or more recent time like it should be more evolved people more like people that are more open to stuff like there's more potential to truly be who you are in like maybe the future or you know at least something else at least it's i feel like that's maybe one of the reasons why there's so much potential like you get to make the rules like you know if you're creating a, a new sci-fi um environment or ip um at least that's one thing yeah literally the sky's the limit i mean you could have so many variations especially when you're talking about races and um peoples that don't even exist if you create them then it could be whatever you want because yeah, like well, like in our in our research, uh, you know, for this, just to be as prepared as we could, um, one thing I kept thinking of was Mass Effect, yeah. just in that like there's an entire race in that game that is kind of it, that is in a sense one gender, but I think really officially like the the Asari are more in a sense genderless, and um, and even with that, like they are very uh, at least you know open when it comes to their relationships, you know, cross. Uh, I almost say species in the right word, but like across race, gender, like the Asari are very open. But this feels like, you know, it's in a thing where like we've already stopped the binary sort of definition in that world already, in a sense, at least especially for the Asari. Mm. Hi. Oh, wow. Hi. Our Hi. final panelist. Oh, yay. Well done. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hey. Um, my name is Kartisha Kent. I work for Instagram Weekly. Um, I also live on Twitter, I'm taking a break right now. But uh, yeah, um, <coughs> trying to get up here was uh, interesting. They have better security than most airports. <laughs> yeah, so. She's also the best dressed on here. I was gonna say, your, your outfit is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, we were just talking about um, what, what it is about uh, science fiction and uh, like other geeky genres that is so inherently queer and that big uh, draws uh, big audiences of LGBT people, if you wanna. Um, excellent question. Um, I would just say like the fantastical nature of it. Um, when you have these like historical dramas or things you're based on reality or like anything that um, kind of champions itself as being grounded, ironically, you know, um, marginalized people are missing from the picture. So like people will pretend that you know queer people are new advent or that black people are new advent or disabled people never existed until like. 
two seconds ago. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so I think the fantastical nature of it removes um, those kind of standard excuses. So now you're like, okay, well, we're in like space or we're, we're in like dimension C Z, like you don't really have an excuse to act like n none of us exist. Mm -hmm. And for like, kind of brushing on what you guys, everyone was sort of saying is like, for example, I'm a huge Trekkie and that's sort of what I always go back to. But like Star Trek shows, what I love about Star Trek, it does two things with queer people. One, uh, up until recently, they mainly sh were able to talk about queer people through you know science fiction allegory, um, which has its own negatives and I'll probably talk about that with a, a future question down the road that we have. Um, but it is also great to be like, look, there, there are characters like Jadzia Dax in, in um, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, who is like a character who used to be a man in a previous you know, host life, uh, but now is a woman. And I read that and I'm like, oh, this is a trans representation, even though she's not explicitly trans. And that's something that I, I, can, in, I can invest in and see myself in a way that I couldn't really see anywhere. And it's also a safe way for me to do that, because I can be like, I love Jetsia Dax, and my parents are thinking, it's like, oh, you know, he is just a, a nerd, instead of being like, oh, she's trans. Um, so it's sort of a safe way to express that. And something else that I also find, um, you know, talking about like superheroes and why superheroes are so popular today, and I talked about this um, on our panel last year a bit, is that there is something in that narrative of like having to hide the best part of yourself, hide your secret identity, um, that was such like a, a big thing for me is like I got that it's like oh I can you know this is something that's so important to me but I can't tell anybody because it's you know I put myself in danger put them in danger it, I might get hurt because of that so that that always spoke to me and what I find interesting within that moving into today is like you look at a lot of superhero stories today and most of the stories don't really have the superheroes hiding their secret identity anymore like all, all the Avengers have pretty much all their identities known, even, you know, spoiler alert for Spider-Man Homecoming, even that. And so it's like, oh, the secret identity thing is going away, and I wonder if that's part and parcel with, like, how queerdom is starting to become more of, um, to the fore. I find that to be an interesting sort of parallel. So uh, going off that, what's uh, your, each of your uh, favorite um, sci-fi show, movie, comic book, etc., and um, what is it about that fandom that uh, first drew you guys in? I guess we'll go down oh. the uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm an obvious Marvel fan, so my go-to is always X-Men. It's like this perfect allegory for like literally everything, um, which is why the movies are very upsetting. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm a Star Wars girl. It sounds kind of basic, but that's like the first uh, <laughs> fandom that uh, really uh, caught my attention. Um, mine, obviously, Star Trek. Um, the reason I love it is, you know, and it kind of goes, again, with what you guys are saying, is like, it shows a future that is expressly our future. It's not like, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, or like, some. it's like, this is what comes out of, you know, Western American society, um, to be fair, but like, what human society could look like. And it's a world that loves diversity, um, and loves the difference in people, um, and, and just celebrates that in a really unique way and fails a lot of the time as you know writers and any creation fails but also you know tries to show the beauty and, and love of diversity and that's that's what really speaks to it uh, for me is just like hey this is a world that I want to see happen this is a world that you know for all its problems that this the goals that it's showing are something beautiful and speak to me and like you know ever since I was a kid that's been instilled in me like I don't think I would be as, you know, who I am today and ha have the values that I have if I hadn't found Star Trek at a young age, and I, I love it for that. Yeah, I think, um, well, I started with Star Wars because my dad collected, he had one of the largest Star Wars collections in the world when I was growing up, so that's where I began. Sold it all off by now, but um, <laughs> unfortunately. But, um, and then I went to Star Trek. I, I kind of, I wouldn't say evolved, but I moved on. And I feel like I do that with all aspects of my life. Like I love something for a, a time and then I evolve, I move on. Uh, Battlestar Galactica was definitely one of those times. Um, I always identify with the villains. Admiral <laughs> Kane, I don't know if any of you saw Battlestar, but she's boss. Yeah. <laughs> but it also goes to queer coding too. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. And I love Battlestar because it had a lot of um, queer characters in it, even though they were on the DL for a long time in it. But it's, it's you know, they're there. And um, now, even though it's my, am I just really loud? I think it's making it a little close. If you want to hear, if you want. <laughs> Hi, sorry. <laughs> um, and 
Hi. Is that better? <laughs> or am I just loud? I think this might have been close. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, um, yeah, but now I like The Witcher, which isn't technically sci-fi, but it's still fantasy. Um, Create your own world. Yeah. Well, and my, my number one fandom is actually probably The Simpsons, so it's not really sci-fi at all. Uh, <laughs> but, like, uh, when it came to the sci-fi stuff, I realized, like, the, the stuff I, I spend the most time in is all video game related, and so... Um, it made me think a lot, at least, about some games that I've really attached to. And, like, I mean, this is just a fun little, hey, yeah, because I've been working on the Outer Worlds campaign since it launched, or since the campaign started, and at least, um, I can at least confirm there is LGBTQ representation in that game. So exciting. Which is kind of cool, because one thing I realized, um, at least from my thoughts about, like, Mass Effect, because Mass Effect was one of the first times I'd really had, like, a... Uh, like any sort of same-sex romance options that were like truly like you could participate in and um but the bummer is i realized like at least for me i didn't meet a canonically gay character in that until the third one and so often a lot of it spoke to this i hate to say like a weird sort of like growing up fantasy of like well they're interested in, in me if i ask nicely like they've never expressed any sort of interest in any sort of, any same sex relationships at all but if you ask Miranda real nice you know under certain contexts then yes she is open to i guess being bisexual in this world and so it's kind of it's interesting in that like I didn't meet like a truly like gay character until the third one and it broke my heart to break up with Tally to be with him but you know you got to do what you got to do uh, and so at really least do. like poor that's Tally. you know yeah poor Tally I love her I killed her <laughs> monster <laughs> Very on accident, accident. No. on accident, on accident. Um, she identifies with villains well something mm. something that I'm finding interesting too with video games too is um this movement, there was cyberpunk, uh, the new cyberpunk game. Yeah. They just announced that you're not going to be choosing your gender it's in that. Genderless. You're just going to choose your body type and your voice type. Yeah, yeah. which mm -hmm. is like super cool. I'm like it never so excited. Yeah, I'm like. It has a date. <laughs> no, it has a date. April. Right? April. April. Yeah. After what, like five, eight years? That's been a long time. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I'm super excited about that because I'm like, I'm super excited to have like a female body type and then just have like this gruff male voice come out of it. And I'm like, because that's like me to a degree. Not that I have like the most masculine voice, but like I know that feel and like that's super. I, I don't know. I'm just very excited about that. Well, because like, and right now we are seeing, sort of seeing like an interesting um, level of of the video game industry kind of reacting. Mm -hmm. I think because I know like I feel like the cyberpunk thing was almost a reaction to the sort of two or three missteps that have happened as that game has gotten promoted recently, where there's been some uh, some insensitivities that have been called out. And I think this was almost them sort of like being like, okay, cool, like we're making a a big adjustment here in order to like sort of recognize that we don't really need to have a like, they don't need to, to have a place in this. They just need to let people choose instead of being like, well, this is the, you know, the line in the sand here. At least that's my interpretation of that because there's there were a few things that people kind of responded to. But, like, even, I was thinking, like, uh, even, like, Gears of War 5. Gears of War, we haven't gotten a character who has been confirmed to be LGBTQ yet. Um, but at least for the multiplayer, they added uh, player banners and emblems that are... Uh, you know, pride related, and and I think they even have like they have the pride, the transgender flag, the bisexual flag. I think I they have like they they have quite a bit of, of emblems, and of course, then you know, a small vocal minority of the internet got very upset about it. Of course, um, but like it's even like in a game that is so like overtly machismo, although it is actually really making I think great strides with the Kate storyline for the new, you know, the new the new titles. Um, it's kind of cool to actually see them like at least work in this sort of stuff of like, hey, if you want to have this as your, you know, your player banner, go with it. Bungie did the same thing recently for uh, Destiny 2. Mm -hmm. And so, like, we're starting to see at least more of like, at least, you know, even as players, they're recognizing that the players exist. Yeah. Even if it's not in the game. Um, so I had uh, the next question, and one that I wanted to ask everyone, but I I'm going to change it a little bit just based off of like, what we were all just talking about, mm -hmm. and what you were just sort of saying is like, what I find interesting um, is sometimes there are reactions and like building off of mistakes in the past to create better representation. Um, like for example, the one that I find intriguing, um, and I don't know, how, I, I still don't know how I feel about it, is in spoilers for Star Trek Discovery. If anyone hasn't seen that yet, but there is a gay character in that who gets killed in the first season, um, and he's also the man of color, like the one man of color in that show. So it's like, oh great, you killed the one man of color in, in the gay character. Um, but then in the second season, they they bring him back. Um, and what I liked about how they at least handled it, I don't think it was worth it. I don't think that they should have killed him. I think it was very upsetting. 
Um, as much as I like Star Trek Discovery, um, I thought that that was unnecessarily traumatizing in, in a show that's supposed to be about diversity. But they brought him back, and what I at least appreciated about that is they didn't handle it in a way where it's like, all right, he's back, we're good, we're, we're washing our hands of it. Um, he had to deal with PTSD. Uh, and as much as, again, sucks to see a character have to go through PTSD, uh, you know, seeing another gay character go through PTSD, and like, again, this is why I have so many mixed feelings on it, but it was handled in a way that felt real, and I thought was handled very uh, realistically, despite the weird, crazy sci-fi situation. Like, Wilson Cruz talking about, like, how he dealt with um, disassociation, um, and, like, understanding, like, how disassociation affects people with PTSD and how they sort of distance themselves from the world and push themselves away from people they care about. I thought it was just handled really nicely, and it was a good um, taking a mistake and acknowledging it and doing something with it, even if it wasn't necessarily the right thing to have done in the first place. So I guess the question I want to ask all of you is, like, is there uh, an example of characters that you really loved that they mishandled, um, and how do you feel about that? I don't know, if, at least at the top of my head, if there's a character I feel like that was totally mishandled. I do. It, it does bum me out when I see a show that takes several seasons to finally introduce a character. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, I feel like we should probably just give a overall blanket statement. There would be spoilers throughout this entire panel. Uh, <laughs> um, but like, let's just say, I mean, Stranger Things. We finally got a queer character in season three. I love how they handled that. Like, I, mm -hmm. I love that character. Um, but. Aside from, I guess, weird speculation about a child's sexuality with Will, like, we finally got a character that is, like, truly, like, self-identifying queer. And, but yeah, three seasons. That show is huge, and it took three seasons. Of course, you know, I mean, I guess if you want to take it down a weird rabbit hole, that show takes place in the 80s, it could go into some dark territory. That's honestly not that show's storyline to tell. But, like, um... But I did think it was kind of interesting. We finally got like a true like character, and even like the reveal was so effortless in a way. I was just, I was like, oh, there we go, you know. But yeah, I don't know if that, I'm trying to think if I have any like one that are problematic. But keep going. Well, in um, in Battlestar, there's Lieutenant Gata who is in the entire series, but he does come out, but only in a webisode that wasn't actually related to the seasons. Well, it's related, but it it was in a like a separate web s season series. So people got really angry because he's a main character, you know, he has this interesting storyline and they only revealed it online. It's not even really part of the actual season, any of the seasons. So I feel that was really mishandled. Um, and uh, also, gosh, there was another well, one I had to. Well, I think we talked about this even last year at the panel a little bit. Uh, like, and of course, like sci-fi often lump fantasy in with, um, and just rather, you know, yeah. very geek, uh, but yeah, very gay focus or gay friendly genres. Dumbledore, I think, is like yes, the, Dumbledore. just the best example of like. That's the one. Well, why? Why? Why now? Why are you telling me this now? Mm -hmm. Like, um, which is cool that that's it's great that he is, but I haven't really seen any real impact of it, or really, I don't know why it had to happen after the books were done. We're waiting for the next Fantastic Beast. That's and <laughs> yeah. I mean that's I don't want to speak too much because I've already spoken yeah. a lot. Um, but I'll quick say with that is like what frustrates me is it's always like the we'll get to it down the road like Valkyrie's by in Thor Ragnarok, but you know not explicitly. We'll get to it maybe in the next one possibly. It's Frozen, you know, wait till Frozen three to get your yeah. queer Elsa. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, that's it's always like the passing like hey queer people it's there but we'll like pass the buck down the road. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, I don't want to speak too much because like, no, um, it's not really sci-fi, but um, Legend of Korra. I love how like four seasons, <laughs> literally the last minute in the last season, they finally reveal that Korra and Asami are queer and they love each other. And I love Korra, like Korra's that girl. And I, and I, I liked it a little more than Avatar, but I just hate that like, we could have had like a, for four seasons we could have had a queer <coughs> main character like kicking ass, but they just waited until literally the last minute. Yeah. Um. That was gonna be my example. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I will add by saying um, I, I got so much hate when I tweeted this, but it was just like, uh, yeah, that's. So my issue with a lot of uh, media that does end up, you know, either including queer characters or maybe. Um, like wink wink winking at like a character maybe being queer is that like you know you have to depend on subtext or like you have to read between the margins 
and that's really annoying to me. So when the thing happened with Cora, I like turned my TV off and I just walked <laughs> off. And my brother's like, "What happened?" And I'm just like, "Some BS." <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but my other example, uh, if I'm sticking with like the X Men theme, is definitely Mystique. Mm. Um, Mystique is explicitly by. Um, in canon, um, and she she entertains mostly on um, you know Destiny, who is this disabled psychic question mark of character. You know she has some sort of ability, um, and uh, that gets not included obviously in these these movies or whatever. And, you know we keep kind of bouncing her back between these boring cis men, um, <laughs> Charles and. What's his name? Eric. <laughs> I'm just like, like, okay, but you know, she has other things that she could be doing. I guess you know, um, it, it's just weird because um, there's a for me specifically because I am bi. There's this weird thing that happens in um, not just like sci-fi and fantasy, but even like a comedy or like any any normal normal show or standard a uh, piece of media where like like the bi character, male or female or whatever they identify as, um, will maybe get to be like explicitly bi for like two seconds. Like you'll see them obviously date some other gender and then like maybe in that same episode or maybe like the very next episode something happens like, oh, it didn't work out, I'm back with this dude or back with whatever like gender that they're, you know, technically supposed to be with or whatever. So yeah, the mystique thing bothers me a lot because uh, again, explicitly, by and we don't really get to see it. Well, it's fine. Like the Cora thing, it almost sounds almost like it was, you know, like, well, we've hinted, and now that we're several seasons in, we kind of realize that maybe people don't care, but also, this is the very end. Mic drop. Uh-huh. Like, get upset. It's over. You know, it's like, it, it almost feels like sometimes it is like, yeah, we've had this character for a couple seasons, and we've done some focus group testing, and people like this character enough where even if they, you know, an element of their personality finally gets revealed, even our like diehards who maybe aren't necessarily cool will be cool just because they love the character. It's almost like you know, it's like we've tested it, we'll make it. We've insected yeah. queerness in. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that will happen between um, Catra, Scorpia, and oh. Shira and Shira because okay. <laughs> they have an interesting love triangle. And that's I the like problem. It. Going back to what she, uh, you said about subtext, is that sometimes subtext goes a lot of way over a lot of people's heads. So like, unless like you're looking for it, like you miss it otherwise. Mm-hmm. This, that's, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, that's something, like, it, it bothered me, too, in, like, the latest um, It Chapter 2 yes. movie. Yes. Like, it drove me crazy, because I, I went and saw it with my partner, who is also trans and bi, and, you know, she I talk about the stuff all the time, so she has a pretty good barometer for, like, reading subtext. Um, and we went and saw the movie, and, again, spoilers, the whole arc of Bill Hader's character, who's, like, the central, you know, he has the most character growth in that movie. Um, his whole arc is... You know, he's gay and hasn't been able to come out about it his entire life. And then the person that he has feelings for at the end, again, spoilers, I won't say who, but that character dies. And then there's a moment in the, like one of the scenes where you like, he's surrounded by his friends, they're all being supportive, he's crying that his friends died, and you're like, oh, this is the moment he's gonna come out, he's gonna say it, it's like, I'm gay. And he doesn't, and like, that's his arc. That's his character's arc in the thing, is that he needs to come out and accept who he is, and he doesn't do it in the film. And they, like, subtly hint towards it. Like, he writes his name next to, like, Hart, me, and this other guy that died, and this, this bridge at the end. And I'm like, but you're not making it clear. Just say it, because that's, that's the point of his arc, and they don't. And I left the movie, and I'm like, well, that was, at least it was, like, somewhat clear. And then I turned to my partner, and she's like, he was gay? Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, and she's one who's sh- like, she's really good at that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, because they don't, they they want to be able to sell this movie in China or wherever, wherever that like explicitly hides this stuff because of the government there, and you know, and also just in America because you don't want to cause a controversy with you know certain groups. And it's just like, but if you don't do that, you're number one not you're not fulfilling your story, and you're also, you know, these stories have power. These stories can change people's minds. Like that's. You know, that's the stuff with Cora, and it's like, you know, as, mu- as problematic as it is, and as problems I have, is like, we need more explicitly queer characters who are queer from the start, and that's important. There is also something to be said about, like, showing that in a movie that's like, surprise, gay, um, it, it does at least teach that. And it's like, if you're going to do that, at least do it so it mean- means something. And, you know, there's benefits to both sides of it, I guess. Um, 
I'm also going to add, um, on one hand, the, you know, the China thing is often a cop out. Uh, oh, because yeah. we have enough homophobia in this country to deal with. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think we need to be exporting, you know, or it, would it be imported? Whatever. <laughs> um, whatever the actual correct word is, it, you know, our hate from other countries. I feel like, you know, um, execs, um, executives here have enough of an issue with it that it keeps getting either sidelined or um, just omitted. And then the second part, just, you know, piggybacking off the it thing, that really made me upset um, because, first of all, Bill Hader is an excellent actor, and I know he could have pulled it off. They gave him that room to do it, and they don't. And then in addition to that, again, spoilers, um, if you have watched the film or if you haven't, there's explicitly at the beginning of the oh, yeah. film a very terrible hate crime that obviously is geared towards queer people, but explicitly like, you know, um, gay men. And I thought it was um, very disrespectful to kind of retain that part of the book, you know, be like, hey, you know, this is what was happening in the 80s, blah, blah, blah. And then you have the background of like AIDS and HIV, right? Even if it's not mentioned in the film. Um, so they're okay with putting that, you know, as dying, something terrible happening to us, but they can't give us a moment where we're affirming ourselves or sharing ourselves with our friends or family or even just um, loudly declaring that we're here. I thought it was, <laughs> yeah. I was like, why? Like, why? And then, you know, obviously you think about who made the movie and whatever, but I, I feel like that, that imbalance that happens in media where, you know, it's they're okay with us dying versus showing us in these like happier um, situations. Um, maybe dramatic situations that don't necessarily require depth, you know, I think it's something that's worth delving into because um, there's something there that's, like, very disturbing to me. I think also, I think part of it goes to, like, because you know someone, some executive in the scene is like, oh, we're being so woke with this scene. Like, like look, we're showing people are going to feel sad for the gay character. And, like, with a lot of that, and I see this in Star Trek, like, one of my favorite episodes of Star Trek, uh, does this where they they want to talk about queer issues and they you know a straight person like wants like let's talk about queer issues and queer representation and what they want to do is they want to make you feel bad like like look we should feel bad for these people we need to like treat them better and do better um, and so like the story is being told to teach a lesson to other people and like I said there's value in that and I get that but the problem is because it's mostly straight creators doing, creating, you know, media that speaks to straight that's supposed to speak directly to straight people. They tend to want to do this that, that sort of like lesson thing. And it's like, but then that's all we're allowed to be. All we're allowed to be is the lesson. All we're allowed to be is just this sort of thing to teach you. And we so rarely get to like be celebrated and and have or just be part of a narrative. Like uh, one of my favorite characters is um, Nomi in Sense Eight, who is a trans woman, but you. You, she's better known for her abilities as a hacker. And like her transness isn't incidental. There are storylines that involve her transness in that, but her abilities and her, contribu her um, contribution to the story is that she's a hacker. And I love that you can have queer characters that are defined by other traits and their queerness or their transness or um, you know, they're part of a minority group. It's just part of their story, but not the defining part of it. And I think that's important. So, so um, I love that. Do you remember the first time you guys ever saw yourself explicitly in media, in sci-fi, or whatever? Mm. Downton Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh. Yeah, I, I have no idea. It's funny, actually, I think probably the first time, uh, and I can't remember the character's name now, which is real weird. I think probably the closest I've gotten to like the level of at least how much thought I put into my sexuality versus how I kind of just operate on a day-to-day -day basis was Scott Pilgrim's roommate mm -hmm. like and I mean that's like pretty late I was like in my when I talk about how old I was when that thing happened um, but like yeah it, I think I mean just I, I don't know because I for the longest time I was still trying to figure out exactly how I even fit into because like, based on the, the representation I'd seen growing up and trying to and I guess and, and coming to terms with being honest and, and coming out and all this sort of stuff uh, like I didn't see any representation, so I didn't have what I felt was, I guess, a sort of primer for how I am going to handle myself. I thought if I was going to come out, I had to change my personality to be what I'd seen. 
Um, and then, to be honest, like the first representation I saw that made me really identify was not sci-fi. It was a real person. It was uh, the Dave Holmes from MTV. Mm -hmm. uh, was one of the first times when I realized, like, oh, oh, okay, I can just be a massive nerd um, who's mm -hmm. very, you know, like, just my brain's full of useless information, uh, or very useful now, it seems, uh, mm -hmm. since I've made a living out of it. And, you know, and also gay. And, like, that was a really, that was the thing that, that clicked for me, but I still haven't seen a character, I think, that really, like, hit it home for me yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say I'm just an accumulation of a ton of different, uh, characters, honestly, um, probably all villains. A lot of Disney in there. Um, even though it's not sci-fi related, it is nerd related. I would think maybe Chung Li from Street Fighter had a lot to do with me coming to terms because I remember my brother when we were at the arcade back when you had to stand in line. He'd be like, "Why do you always choose the girl?" And it's always stuck with me, and I never really had an answer because she's the coolest to me. But it's something that stuck with me, and I'm like, "Okay, well maybe." there is something there. Why do I always choose Katana? Why do, when I'm playing Diablo for the first time, I choose the um, Amazon? It's always the woman. And I think it just, it accumulated through my life where I start identifying with these characters because that's who I am and that's who I who I always was. I just didn't have a, a way to express it until I transitioned, so, yeah. Um, for me, uh, first, character that really spoke to me was Nomi, like I mentioned. I love um, her. Yeah, she's, I, I adore her with all yeah. of my heart. Um, I, I will share quickly uh, one of my favorite stories. The first time like I realized I was trans through pop culture was the first live action Scooby-Doo movie, where, weirdly enough, <laughs> there's that scene where they all switch bodies. <laughs> <laughs> And there's a point where Fred is in Daphne's body, and he's like, I'm going to look at myself naked. And I'm like, why would you want to look at yourself naked? And then I'm like, wait, I want to be a girl, not for the sex part, because I want to be a girl, just because I, like, I want to be a girl. <laughs> so it was like, that was like how I learned about sex, and then gender, and it was very confusing, all wrapped up in a Scooby-Doo wrapper. <laughs> so right. try unraveling that knot. <laughs> just pull, the, pull that mask off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, cool. Okay. All right. Um, mine's not even sci-fi related, really. Um, mine is uh, Annalise Keating from um, How to Get Away with Murder. Um, she is a um, dark-skinned, bisexual lawyer. Um, not quite murderer, but murderer, but almost there. <laughs> you know, because she, she manages, you know, for the most part to technically keep her hands clean. But, um, yeah, you know, she... I don't want to say it was sudden because I feel like she's always had this like flirtatious vibe with like everyone, which is why I really love her. Um, and then you know, um, Famke shows up and they're like, "Oh yeah, we used to have a thing," and I'm like, "What?" <laughs> so um, that was very excited, exciting for me because you know I had seen bi characters before, I'd seen black characters before, but never in one package who calls herself Viola Davis. So <laughs> I was very um, excited about that. And um, things like that kind of give me hope that, hey, there are people out there actually working on these things, even if they are very slow, so. Um, mine isn't really sci-fi related either, but I saw my, I've only just recently seen myself like, reflected like in media with through uh, Miko Santos from Superstore. I've never seen a gay Filipino fam, like funny, hilarious. <laughs> on TV before, and then also Titus from Known Breakable Kimmy Schmidt, another mm -hmm. uh, unapologetically <laughs> femme, uh, uh, plus size, queer, like a um, man of color. Like, uh, so this was just recently, and those aren't even sci-fi. But I'll say, like, growing up, too, going off like how you always pick girls, uh, who I had to uh, identify with growing up, too, was like characters like, like Padme and like other like strong women, because, how to put this, like they were so, like they were independent, free thinking, queens, costume changes. And <laughs> no, no, there was just something about all the, all the women, they were more compelling to me growing up. And I always identify with that. Like, like I had to hide my femininity growing up and then they like um, were powerful and loved in spite of it. So I really found that um, powerful growing up, <laughs> basically. <laughs> So um, my the question I had next on the list was, um, and we kind of touched upon this, but explicitly, like, what tropes do you see like queer coded characters in that you that you liked, but also have found problematic? Like for me, my example would be, um, we constantly see non-binary characters as like 
asexual aliens or robots. Like even, for example, I think one of the most recent prominent examples was in Borderlands 3. Um, there is uh, the, there is a non-binary character as one of the playable characters, but they're a robot. Oh, Flack? Yeah, Flack. And it's like... Oh, that's oh, what so, I'm playing as, actually. Yeah, <laughs> which is, like, no. I'm very happy to see like more non-binary representation, but again, non-binary representation is always like, hey, look, they're an alien. Look, they're a robot. Look, they don't have gender. And it's like, you know, non-binary people exist as human beings in the world. So uh, that's sort of my example that I find um, to be... Again, you know, there are benefits to it. There are good things to like, get people to understand non-binary, but then they just sort of see non-binary people as asexual robots. Um, so obviously negatives. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious what you guys, uh, what um, tropes you see. Well, there's the very sexualized trope, like Frankenfurter from um, Rocky Horror. Even though Frankenfurter was a huge part of my growing up because I loved the character, but it's a little problematic, especially when I was like six years old and I was like, I want to wear fishnets and walk around in a garter belt. Um, maybe not the most, well, it was inspiring to me, but maybe not the best role model for me. But, um, you know, that was also the 70s. And um, I think uh, characters are evolving. But, um, yeah, I would say that being sexualized, um, trans or queer characters are all very problematic. Well, I'd say it's probably the um, the sort of sassy, quippy, gay best friend kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yes, we, you know, can dress cute and, and have witty remarks, but also <laughs> we aren't here to perform all the time. Because mm -hmm. um, even like uh, during uh, Orphan Black, Felix is a great example of sort of like this light comic relief. He is highly functional as a character, which is great. Mm -hmm. But like he's not nearly as functional and awesome as Cosima. Which mm -hmm. at least, who was queer from the get-go, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, like, there's that sort of, like, yeah, just the, the comic relief element that's a little, the harder thing to sort of just be like, all right, cool, like, I don't have to be spitting gems all the time. <laughs> I hate uh, barrier gays, obviously, the most. Um, I think the most recent example in, like, science fiction is the 100 with, uh, what's her name? Klexa? Yeah. Or that, that's their ship name, I yeah. forget the actual... Does that the the character? Yeah. Lexa. Lexa, thank you. Lexa and Clark. She, she was explicitly queer, right? Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. oh, dead. Yeah, that was, that was <laughs> sad. I remember that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hate all of them. Um, <laughs> uh, if I can uh, narrow it down, I guess... Um, the first one, and uh, you, you'll have to forgive me because I can't think of an explicit sci-fi example. Um, the only recent example of this that I can actually think of is Pose. Um, I don't like, you know, the queer as a result of trauma. Mm. That pisses me off. Because um, you're, you're saying that, you know, my queerness, my transness, whatever I, I am, is in direct response to something terrible that happened to me, which is no. Um, <laughs> and um, and then if it further like others, you know, um, queer people, because um, it's almost like oh you're this mutation or you're this anomaly that happened because again this terrible thing happened. And I'm just like everybody has trauma. Like why is this a thing that you know is just is, is so explicitly associated with queer people? Um, and then, this isn't technically a trope, but it's come up um, somewhat on the panel, is um, almost like the queer as an afterthought, um, slash, you know, queer getting, you know, cut on the, the editing <laughs> room floor. Um, I have a lot of issues um, with this, particularly with the MCU. Um, it's happened twice now with um, Valkyrie and um, Okoye. Um, and I'm like, if you can sneak a shawarma scene into the last five <laughs> minutes of Avengers, you can show a Koye like winking at like so. It's it's yeah, it's yeah. annoying. But um, yeah. And uh, just to wrap things up because I know we're uh, almost out of time. Um, yeah, a lot of media has slowly but surely uh, been getting more and more LGBT inclusive, very 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 slowly, and uh, some franchises more than others. Um, but do you, any of you think you'll ever see like a day when at least maybe like every show or every movie has one or two queer characters or like and it's not we're not just performing or just uh, an afterthought to people 
I think it'll happen, but it's going to require um, us to be in the room. Mm -hmm. I feel like if we keep depending on, um, you know, um, you know, the common denominator or like the classic cis white male who can't really relate to anyone, um, we're just going to keep seeing ourselves come up as like tokens or mm -hmm. afterthoughts. And something that like I, I run a YouTube channel, um, and a lot of the comments that I get when I talk about queerness, they're like, "Why are gay people in every film now? Why do they need to be in everything?" And I'm like, "Well, they're like in what, like six? Um, and the only reason you're like noticing it is because like we were not there at all before, and so now you're like, "Oh, look, gay people are in a thing. That's they have to be in everything." It's like, no, you're just noticing because we weren't there before, and I feel like that's that's the big push to like get through is people like you know, having to push through this really like this line of like, it's been this way for so long and so everyone thinks that this is the way it should be. And it's like, we know we need to go through that. And I think what it's gonna take is the next generation, um, not to use a Star Trek pun. Um, <laughs> Engage. But like the people growing up now, like, you know, the kids growing up now, hopefully they will be able to watch and see like, you know, they'll turn on Star Trek and there'll be a gay character there. They'll turn on, you know, like any CW show and there'll be queer characters there and it, it won't be perfect. And you know, I hate to be like, oh, it's gonna take time because it shouldn't take time. It should just exist. But at least what gives me hope is like these small changes are being made, and so maybe the next generation will like get it a little bit more because it will seem more normal. And I think that that's the biggest thing. That even though it's will take a lot longer than I want it to, I think that that's that's what it's really gonna take is just like slowly making queer people just being part of things as normal as opposed to queer people being like, hey look, it's the queer character, look at how a big deal is, like we got our queer character in the show now finally. It's like, no, they're just like, oh yeah, this character happens to be gay in this thing. Yeah, I agree with both of you. It, we need queer people in the writer's room or else we're going to have straight cis people representing us and our stories will be fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be bad. Um, <laughs> well, and like, uh, so this actually made me think just recently about like, um, there was a, a video that I saw years ago from um, Feminist Frequency about the Bechdel test and how I was actually introduced to it. And um, that year, I think there were nine Best Picture nominees. It was the year that uh, Moneyball was one of the nominees. And um, she looked at them and she was like, of like the eight or nine Best Picture nominees, I think only two of them passed the Bechdel test. Moneyball literally had two women in it and they never even talked to each other. Like that entire movie had two women. And I, never, I watched it and didn't even think about it. Like, and that was the thing where like, I didn't even notice that there was a lack of representation. And the interesting thing is, I feel like right now, unfortunately, when we see a lot of LGBTQ characters, a lot of people who normally wouldn't notice a lack of women, they notice the presence of them, and then they start talking about it. And so it, what's kind of interesting is that like women somehow became invisible while like the gays became a visible problem, or like mm -hmm. the, the queer you know representation became a queer or a visible problem. And so I think there's this weird thing of like, because I feel like there's we're trying to make everything right, but until like people get used to stuff, you know, being there, um, you know, we, we can't even go invisible yet. Like, it's kind of interesting because like right now there's such a spotlight, but it's not always the best one. And like, and so I feel like there's, it's another problem. I don't know if I even made anything clearer, but I thought it was kind of interesting <laughs> to sort of see like, at least it was a blind spot of mine for a long time, at least about women in movies. Like I didn't even think about it until someone pointed out and I was like, oh shit. Excuse me. Yeah, now, my husband and I, like, whenever we see any movie, we walk out and we're like, did it pass? The yeah. Anna, can you explain mm. Bechdel for those who don't uh, know? So, uh, it's basically that, um, are there two women in a movie? Some people uh, want those women to both have names. Crazy people. <laughs> um, and uh, so, rule one is, are there two women in this movie? Uh, second rule is, do they talk to each other? Third rule is, do they talk about something other than a man? And, um, and it's just amazing how often, like, the, the male perspective is the thing that pushes the narrative forward so much that two women can only talk about the thing that keeps this movie going, which is him, you know? And it's just kind of this thing. And, um, you know, also, I you know, like, uh, the husband, he actually recently started talking about, he wanted to call it the, the Big Dell Test, another sort of thing of, like, is there uh, a character of size in anything that isn't used as a joke, you know, or talking about, like, I'm doing my best and I'm dieting, you know? Like, is there anything where you can just have a big character who's just a character? You know. yeah. And it's also not, just to quick wrap up, it's also not always a, 
it, just because something passed the Bechdel test doesn't mean it's great either. Oh, yeah. not at all. <laughs> not at all. The bare minimum. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the minimum. The bare minimum. And that spun off other tests like Mako Mori, and uh, mm -hmm. there's yeah. a bunch of other like, media tests people use to see whether something is truly inclusive. But that's, again, I've said the bare minimum. Yeah. 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 Uh, before we, because we probably have to run, yeah. uh, everyone should promote themselves. Where can you find everyone here? Cool. So, I think, yeah. I think. Uh, bit different podcast, uh, Bit Diff Podcast on uh, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I am also uh, at Fast Danger on Twitter. And I'm at Sitting the Dream on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, you can find me on this one's website, pride.com. Um, I also run my own YouTube channel, Jesse Gender, where I talk about like social and political issues through fandoms, mostly Star Trek, but not always exclusively. Um, so yeah, follow me, follow me there. Um, all our work is, my work is on pride.com. I'm on Twitter. I by Rafi, B-Y-R-A-F-F-Y, and yeah. Um, I'm uh, Clark Teacher Kent on Instagram, um, and then on Twitter I am um, I write all day underscore. So, and you can find my articles on entertainmentweekly.com. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.